Well, welcome everyone to Flinders University and to this very special event. My name is Peter Monteith. I'm Professor of History at Flinders University, and it's an honour for me this evening to introduce you to our speaker. Uh, as you might know, the event was originally going to be part of the History Festival, but for reasons beyond our control, uh, we've had to find another way of bringing it to you. Let me start by acknowledging that uh, the land on which we are um, making this magic happen is uh, the land of the Ghana people, the traditional owners of um, the, uh, the lands of the Adelaide Plains. Uh, and I pay my respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. Now, the speaker this evening is Dr. Julian Dooley. Some of you might remember Julian uh, from uh, the time at which she was the Special Collections Librarian here at Flinders University. She's now an honorary senior research fellow in the College of uh, Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences. She has some very wide ranging interests. They, they are across the fields of music and history and literature with a particular passion for Matthew Flinders, about whom she has written quite extensively, um, most recently um, in the form of a book, which I have uh, right next to me. It's called Trim the Cartographer's Cat, the Ship's Cat Who Helped Flinders Map Australia. Now, in the presentation this evening, Julian's going to bring together some of um, those many interests, uh, above all the interests in history, literature and Matthew Flinders. She's talking on the topic Matthew Flinders, life writer. So welcome again to all of you. Thanks for, for being here at Flinders, uh, albeit virtually. Um, a quick reminder that at the end of uh, Julian's presentation, you are more than welcome to ask questions. Uh, for now, though, I'm handing over to Julian. Hello, everybody. Um, Welcome to Flinders University. It's it's uh, it's nice to uh, to be here and among among a lot of friends, I'm sure. Um, yes, my topic today is Matthew Flinders, life writer. Matthew Flinders never wrote an autobiography, but he was constantly reflecting on his life in the written word, sometimes explaining himself to those who were going to be reading his published work or his letters sometimes just explaining himself to himself. He wrote to understand his place in the history of exploration and navigation. He wrote to justify his actions and decisions, both personal and professional. He wrote to express his frustrations and sometimes he wrote to imagine a different life as if to try it on for size. His one explicit excursion into life writing was the one that Peter just mentioned, his biographical tribute to the memory of Trim, which as well as being the story of his cat, I believe can be read as a vicarious autobiography. In this talk, I'll choose just a few examples from countless possibilities, touching only very briefly on the rich vein of material in his letters to explore the self-construction of this young explorer's biography and the way he used words to discover himself and to reveal himself to his readers. Flinders, like other explorers of the time, and indeed perhaps like all ambitious people born in relatively humble circumstances, was driven by a mixture of pride, humility, competitiveness and fear of failure. He knew about the imposter syndrome long before the term was invented and he was always measuring himself against his predecessors and rivals and wondering about his own legacy. He actually wrote at least one memoir to accompany his journals and charts. It is dated Isle of France, 14 May 1805, and the full title is A Memoir Explaining the Marks Used in the Charts of Australia Constructed on Board His Majesty's Ship Investigator and the Manner in Which the Latitude, Longitude and Variation of the Compass were Obtained, Corrected and Applied in Their Construction, with some new facts and additional observations upon those and other nautical subjects connected with Australia by Matthew Flinders, late Commander of the Investigator, a prisoner in the Isle of France. 
This title, though, of course, it purports to be scientific and businesslike, has a sting in the tail. He can't resist the opportunity to point out his unfair imprisonment by the French. And the preface to the memoir gives a short history of all the mishaps that had led to his detention on Mauritius and prevented him finishing the charting of the, the Australian coast to the level of precision he expected of himself. And delving more deeply, we can understand that in explaining these technical matters, he has an agenda. During the investigator surveying voyage, he writes, the original rough charts were always made on the same day in which the land they described had been seen, and most commonly whilst the different parts were in sight. On coming into harbour, or when the distance of the land gave me leisure time, I placed these rough sheets before me, and with the assistance of my logbook, my astronomical observation and bearing book, the whole was afresh laid down with great exactness. Implied in this explanation is a criticism of other chart makers who took the readings and then only completed the charts when they got back to civilization. We're invited to visualize the proud perfectionist straining his eyes, working into the night at his drafting table in his cabin. Trim perhaps sitting at his feet. I'd like to think that he wouldn't be one of those helpful cats who insist on sitting on exactly the most inconvenient spot when his human was trying to get something done. In the memoir, Flinders explains in great detail his choices for the scale of the various maps he drew depending on what would be most useful. But when it came to drawing the first chart of the complete outline of Australia, his explanation betrays the precarity of this enterprise and its very physical limitations. The general chart is drawn upon the scale that suited the only sheet of paper that I had remaining, he said. But the criticism implied earlier soon becomes explicit and he starts harumphing. I have been careful not to insert my own conjectures in the place of actual observation, as has been too much the case with some navigators, to the detriment of true geography and the hindrance of further investigation. Yes, of course, it's always frustrating to find conjectures leading to inaccuracy and error in any kind of research, but then of course it could be disastrous for navigators entering uncharted waters. Hence, I guess, the soapbox style. Flinders begins to get really defensive when describing some of the markings he'd used on the chart to denote various geographic and climatic features, and also the degree of certainty with which he's made observations. It will be seen that these marks are, amongst other uses, intended to be my apologists. I ought not be blamed for the admission, he says, if the weather or the time of night or some other circumstance would have prevented him from noticing some significant feature. His anxiety reaches its peak when he has to explain the corrections he's made to Cook's, Captain Cook's charts of the east coast of Australia. Those who reflect and consider that Captain Cook was liable to all the errors of her first examination and was, at, was without a timekeeper and will readily understand why I have adventured to take such great liberty with the works of so greatly and justly distinguished a navigator, and these circumstances shall be my apology. If the corrections shall be found to approximate the truth, I shall be excused. If it should prove otherwise, I shall never excuse myself. Cook was his idol, and the idea that he might be setting himself up as his critic and correcting his work was deeply intimidating for Flinders. In a letter to Sir Joseph Banks written from Mauritius, from Mauritius in 1804, this complicated young man wrote, I have too much ambition to rest in the unnoticed middle order of mankind. And since neither birth nor fortune have favored me, my actions shall speak to the world. In the regular service of the Navy, there are too many competitors for fame. I have therefore chosen a branch which, though less rewarded by rank and fortune, is, is yet little less in celebrity. If adverse fortune does not oppose me, I will succeed. And although I cannot rival the immortalized name of 
Yet, if persevering industry joined to what ability I may possess can accomplish it, then I will secure the second place. In both his captain's logbook, written at the time of the voyage, and a voyage to Terra Australis, written 10 years later, Flinders wrote of his feelings when the master and carpenter gave him the news that the investigator was rotting and wouldn't survive rough seas. This is the later account from the voyage. I cannot express the su surprise and sorrow which this statement gave me. According to it, a return to Port Jackson was almost immediately necessary, as well to secure the journals and charts of the examinations already made as to preserve the lives of the ship's company. My leading object had hitherto been to make so accurate investigation of the shores of Terra Australis that no future voyage to this country should be necessary. But with a ship incapable of encountering bad weather, I knew not how to accomplish the task. He agonised over the decision, and in the log he wrote out the arguments for, for and against continuing the survey, setting the possible loss of the whole produce of our risks and labours, as well as the loss of our lives. Just think of that one last remaining piece of paper he had to write to draw, draw his chart of the American of the Australian coast. No way of scanning and backing it up to the cloud. Versus the genuine spirit of discovery, which contains all danger and inconvenience when put in competition with its gratification. He goes on, upon the score of duty, I might, it may be said, be forgiven, but I must never boast of a single spark of that ethereal fire with which the souls of Columbus and of Cook were wont to burn. Only then does he bring up the sorry state of health of me and the crew as another factor in deciding to discontinue the work and head for Sydney. Looking back on this decision 10 years later when writing the voyage, he had this to say. The accomplishment of the survey was, in fact, an object so near to my heart that could I have foreseen the train of ills that were to follow the decay of the investigator and prevent the survey being resumed? And had my existence depended upon the expression of a wish, I do not know that it would have received utterance. But infinite wisdom has in infinite mercy reserved the knowledge of futurity to itself. Well, it's not quite suicidal, but it's sort of retrospective despair and written for publication in the void, in the official voyage. And just after making this difficult but inevitable decision, the investigator put in at Timor to take on fresh food and water. Bad move, since it brought dysentery with it. But while he was there, Flinders visited a plantation with shady trees and fish ponds. He wrote, I thought this to be a little paradise and I could not prevent my ideas from dwelling upon the happiness that a man whose desires were moderate might enjoy in this delightful retreat with the beloved of his heart. I thought such a life as well fitted for philosophical and religious contemplation as it was for love and all its train of domestic en enjoyments. But as he pursues his reverie, he starts to see the drawbacks, no amusement or society, the weather too hot for exertion, the roads impassable, no one to discuss his books with. I energetically exclaimed, no, I was not meant for this. My reverie ended here. Here's a really interesting example of writing a parallel self, possibly with the sole intention of re rejecting it and asserting the real self, the one whose desires are not moderate, the one who is not meant for vegetating in an island paradise. And this, as far as I can tell, was written just for himself. It's only just been published. Um, it appears out of order at the beginning of a volume of the fair copy of his captain's logbook. And it's probably there because it was the only blank paper he had available and the notebook later had to be used for official purposes. Another construction of self appears in the private journal. During uh, his years in Mauritius, uh, Flinders kept a journal, which uh, he, he then maintained until he, 
almost until the day he died. And Flinders quite often confided in his journal, apparently for himself alone. He would begin entries with expressions like, it is some time since I have expressed the states, state of my sentiments and feelings. Some of these entries are profoundly moving, detailing his isolation and struggles with depression. But in October 1805, he was in quite good spirits. He'd been allowed to live in the countryside after nearly two years in confinement and was out walking with his French friends. Exploring the spectacular Tamarind Falls, he found a cavern behind the waterfall and presumably back in his room, wrote about the reflections he had made firstly on the geophysics of the area and then proceeding to draw an analogy with politics. The greater the inequalities are, the higher the mountains are above the valleys or that kings are above other men, the more is a sudden fall or revolution to be apprehended. Then his thoughts turn towards the vicissitudes of my own life. I was born in the fens of Lincolnshire, where a hill is not to be seen for many miles at a distance from the sea, and my family unconnected with sea affairs or any kind of enterprise or ambition. This is actually fudging things a bit. He had a cousin in the Navy, John Flinders, who told him what he needed to read if he wanted to be a sailor. And John's sister, Henrietta, was a governess who introduced him to her boss, Captain Thomas Pusley who got him his first posting in a Navy ship. But it's true that his father, a surgeon and man midwife, didn't want him to go to sea. He was to be apprenticed and follow the same profession. Anyway, his story um, under the, written under the waterfall purportedly continues. After many incidents of fortune and adventure, I found myself a commander in the Royal Navy having been charged with an arduous expedition on discovery, having visited a great variety of countries, made three times the tour of the world, find my name known in more kingdoms than that where I was born, with some degree of credit. And this moment, a prisoner in a mountainous island in the Indian Ocean, lying under a cascade in a situation very romantic and interior, meditating upon the progress which nature is continually making towards a moderate degree of equality in the physical and moral worlds. And in company with a foreigner, a Frenchman whom I call and believe to be my friend. The romantic and interior situation are reminiscent of the little paradise he encountered on Timor. But here on Mauritius, he had achieved a kind of accommodation with the restrictions of his life and befriended some of the foreigners amongst whom he found himself. He knits his life together with his environment. These observations he makes on the physical and moral worlds are linked to his, uh, his origins in the fens of Lincolnshire, surely one of the flattest places on earth and perhaps thus in his mind, one of the least romantic. And his current picturesque situation in a mountainous island far from home. Another kind of life writing that Flinders had experimented with a few months earlier was a day in the life. One particular journal entry is marked differently to all the others. Um, it, there's a solid line drawn across the page, followed by a centred heading, Journal of Sunday, August 18th. He follows himself through one of his last days in the garden prison or Maison Depot before he was allowed to go and live in the country on par parole. Activities, thoughts, memories, speculations, complaints, commentary on what he's reading, all these jostle together in a kind of stream of consciousness experiment. It begins, rose at half past six, slipped on my shoes and morning gown and went down to walk in the garden. Met the sergeant and bid him bonjour. Think the old man looks a little melancholy at the prospect of his last prisoner leave, leaving the house for he will lose his situation. A little bit later, half past eight, Elder not returned from the bazaar yet, can't think what keeps him, laid the cloth and the breast breakfast things myself and ordered Smith to bring me the tea kettle. Used plenty of milk in my tea and made a good breakfast. Took three pinches of snuff whilst I sat thinking of my wife and friends in England. Memorandum, 
must not take so much snuff when I return, for it makes me spit about the rooms. He then goes on to describe the events of the morning. Returned upstairs, washed and sat down to dinner at two o'clock. The French beans are very good in this island. And so it goes on for more than 2000 words. I could go on quoting. I would be interested to know actually whether Flinders had a model, whether there were similar passages in journals contemporary with this or whether he'd hit upon this way of writing independently. And did he write it as the day went on or was it written in retrospect? The writing's very neat and even and there's no evidence of stopping and starting in the manuscript. But I think he had a habit of making fair copies of things, but it's hard to know what he did on the actual day. One form that Flinders used was certainly not original um, and it was a song lyric. As far as I know, he only wrote one and it forms part of the dialogue that he, he maintained with his wife during his nine year absence or their nine years apart. Only his side of the correspondence remains and destroyed her own letters. But in this single case, there's a precious example of her response to his communication. In November 1805, he sent her a letter. Comparatively with my situation in this island for the first 20 months, I'm now very happy. And yet I often retire to the little pavilion, which is my study and bedroom. And with my flute in my hand and sometimes tears in my eyes, I warble over the little evening song of which I sent thee a copy. Ah, my beloved, then my heart overleaps the distance of half a world and wholly embraces thee. The evening song was presumably enclosed with this or an earlier letter. He wrote out the words and music, attributing the melody to Haydn. That's a story in itself. I finally identified it after years of trying because it's not exactly what Haydn wrote, but it's the uh, it comes from the slow movement of Haydn Symphony number no. 53. In any case, the words were his own. Why, Henry, didst thou leave me, thus leave me here to mourn? Ah, cruel, thou deceivedst me, I ne I'll ne'er see thy return. Thou knewst how much I loved thee, yet could resolve to go. My griefs could nothing move thee, though I was sunk in woe. Henry, being addressed here in the second person, is obviously Matthew himself and he's imagining what Anne would say to him, or perhaps what she had said to him in the letters that don't survive. The way I read this first verse is as his apology to Anne, implied by writing the words from her point of view. But in the second verse, he makes his excuses and, act in, and, and enacts her, forgiving him because she understands his point of view. But why do I thus blame thee? Alas, thou couldst not stay, for when stern duty calls thee, thou canst not but obey. Thy looks bespoke the anguish, the struggle in thy breast, etc. And he wrote to be completed at the bottom. He didn't write the last word, of, last line of that verse. Well, his attempt at self-justification doesn't seem to have backfired because perhaps because uh, he made this gesture of incompleteness, inviting her to co-author their life together, as it were. With the manuscript, which is held in the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich, there's a scrap of paper with a last line for the second verse, plus two more verses in what has been identified as Anne Flinders writing. What I imagine happened was that she received the song sometime in 1806 and accepted his implied invitation to complete it probably writing those words during the years before he returned in 1810. Maybe she even sent him the completed version, though there's no re record of his receiving it. And because the war with France um, had, uh, the communication had become impossible because of, there was a blockade of Mauritius by the English, by the British. When he returned in October 1810, when he returned to when he returned home to England, he wrote that he had been nearly four years and a half without intelligence from any part of my connections, his family. Anyway, after dwelling on her own pain, Anne reimagined re or imagines their reunion. 
She says, will comfort's cheering sunshine air beam on this sore heart? Yes, when we meet my Henry, never again to part. From this collaborative scrap of life writing in which he attempts a second person narrative, we can move on to his one real essay into explicit life writing, the, his biographical tribute to the memory of Trim, written while he was still on Mauritius. He mentions having written it out at the beginning of 1807, but the manuscript we have is dated 1809. Presumably it went through several drafts in that case. Um, we don't know whether he shared it with anyone else. It seems to have been discovered among his papers in the late 19th century, and it's now in the Greenwich Maritime Museum. You can feel in this essay, which is about 5,000 words long, the full force of Flinders' longing for everything he'd been denied, all embodied in this ship's cat. Trim may even have been an idealised version of himself, brave, daring, useful, affectionate and courteous. The history of his imprisonment is narrated from Trim's point of view in, in the biographical tribute. The Minikin, which is what they call the Cumberland, which was the very small ship they were in when they were taken prisoner at Mauritius. The Minikin being very leaky was obliged to stop at the Isle of France, Mauritius. And there, poor Trim, his master and few followers were all made prisoners under the pretext that they had come to spy out the nakedness of the land, though it was clear as day that they knew nothing of the war that had taken place a few, a few months before. Trim was confined in a room with his master and another officer. And as he possessed more philosophy than we did, he contributed by his gay humour to soften our straight captivity. Trim was sent to live with a little girl and her mother. He escaped and was never seen again. Flinders suspected that he'd been, that he'd been caught and eaten by some hungry black slave, but nobody, of course, actually knows. At the end of his biographical tribute, Flinders includes an epitaph for Trim, which is in a way more poetic than his song lyric. To the memory of Trim, the best and most illustrious of his race, the most affectionate of friends, faithful of servants and best of creatures. He made the tour of the globe and a voyage to Australia, which he circumnavigated and was ever the delight and pleasure of his fellow voyagers. Returning to Europe in 1803, he was shipwrecked in the great equinoxial ocean. That this danger escaped, he sought refuge and assistance at the Isle of France, where he was made prisoner contrary to the laws of justice, of humanity and of French national faith, and where, alas, he terminated his useful career by an untimely death, being devoured by the catophagi of that island. Many a time have I beheld his little merriments with delight and his superior intelligence with surprise. Never will his like be seen again. Trim was born in the southern Indian Ocean in the year 1799 and perished as above at the Isle of France in 1804. Peace be to his shade and honour to his memory. Can we read into this Flinders projection of all his own disappointed hopes and thwarted ambitions onto this best of creatures? In hindsight, it's impossible to resist carrying the comparison even further. After all, Flinders himself was within a few short years to terminate his useful career by an untimely death. While Flinders prided himself on being scientific and scrupulously accurate in his professional activities, he was constantly spilling over into the parenthetical speculation and what seemed like quite private rumina ruminations in the margins of his scientific work, as it were. The demarcation between the official and the scientific and the personal and imaginative is not that clear. In a letter to Anne from December 1800, when it seemed that he, they would not be able to marry, he wrote, the search after knowledge, the contemplation of nature in the barren wild, 
the overhanging crags of utmost height and the open field decked with the spicy attire of the tropical climes may, nay, must prevent me from casting one thought on England, on my home. Although in this case he was suggesting that the search for knowledge might distract him from his personal troubles, he was certainly thoroughly initiated in the heady spirit of romantic science, described by Richard Holmes in The Age of Wonder. Romanticism as a cultural force is generally regarded as intensely hostile to science, its ideal of subjectivity eternally opposed to that of scientific objectivity. But I do not believe, says Holmes, um, that this was always the case or that the terms were so mutually exclusive. He goes on, the notion of wonder seems to be something that once united them and can still do so. In effect, there is romantic science in the same sense that there is romantic poetry and often for the same enduring reasons. Holmes goes on to talk of the new imaginative intensity and excitement that romanticism brought to science. It was driven by a common ideal of intense, even reckless personal commitment to discovery. The idea of the exploratory voyage, often lonely and perilous, is in one form or another, another uh, central and defining metaphor of romantic science. And it seems to me that that's absolutely embodied in Flinders. It's not surprising that Flinders' private journal includes very much personal and revealing writing, but we also find extraordinary passages like that one written in Timor in the official captain's log of the investigator, which he would have had to hand into the Admiralty when he got back to London. And even when he seems to be sticking to the facts, he, he understands instinctively the importance of acknowledging his subjective point of view and circumstances when describing his methodology. But for his one foray into actual biographical writing, he didn't write about himself or another human being, but concentrated his energies on his beloved cat trim, whose short life significantly coincided with his own short active career. Thank you. I think there's a there's a chance to ask questions if you would like to. Beck has asked me a little bit more about Flinders' writings once he returned home. My goodness me, when after he returned home, he had a, a little over three and a half years um, living in England before he died with with his wife Anne. Um, he spent a lot of that time. He kept he kept his journal. He kept um, writing up his journal every day, although he didn't have quite such uh, a long, um, those long introspective entries. But he was also, of course, writing his voyage to Terra Australis, which is which is an enormous book. It's it's two big volumes of writing as well as the charts. So he, he was very he was very busy and very occupied and that really took up most of the time he left. He had left. After um, after he returned and um, of course we don't know what happened to Trim. We we um, we just have to guess. Whether uh, Trim really the resourceful cat that Trim was didn't uh, perhaps make his way onto another ship or just go off and, and find a new life somewhere. Um, when I was in Mauritius last a uh, couple of years ago, I, I found a little black and white cat near where Flinders was was staying. So I did wonder whether perhaps he was a descendant. Uh, he looked very much like Trim. If you have any more questions, write them in the box there. There we go. Oh, uh, Matt, uh, with our better understanding of mental health nowadays, how do you think Flinders reflections might have been changed, might have changed? I don't know. I think he, um, I think he, he, he was really reading those, those, those journal entries. He was, he w was, was very insightful into, into what, uh, you know what? What it, he of course didn't have the terminology that we have, but he understood himself very well. But perhaps, and he 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 kind of, he kind of managed himself as well. He did bring himself out of it by by making sure that he 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 ate well and that he got plenty of plenty of exercise and all those things that we we're being told now that we must do. And also by by making sure that he had 
he kept in touch with people, uh, however much he didn't feel like going and uh, meeting people and, and socialising. Um, Alessandro has asked, uh, did Flinders talk of, about himself in terms of the other men on the investigator assess himself in terms of their qualities? That's a very interesting question. Um, he did, um, he wrote, hmm, um, he wrote about, in, in his letters, I suppose he did that to a certain extent. There, there, was, a, there was a letter he wrote to Anne where he, he sort of summed up the other people on the voyage, uh, particularly the other, the scientists and the officers, and he, he talked about them, he talked about their qualities. Um, he, I'm not sure that he was comparing himself so much, but there's that very famous letter to, to George Bass that he wrote to George Bass, uh, where, he, where he did compare himself to Bass. Um, and also um, when he was back in um, Mauritius, he wrote a, a fascinating letter to his friend, Tommy Pitot, about the nature of friendship and what sort of friend Flinders was and what sort of friend Pitot was. That, that is, that, that is re really fascinating. Um, uh, uh, yes. Um, and so he, I think he sort of knew himself quite well. I think he was, he was, he was quite intro, self uh, introspective. Uh, early education. Um, yes, um, his early education is, uh, was at a, um, I think he, he would have probably been, he was taught at the sort of local, um, uh, I, I've, not sure if they were called dame schools at the time, but the sort of local sort of primary school, uh, quite informal. Uh, he spent two years at the high school in Donington, which is still in Donington, and they're very proud of having uh, Matthew Flinders as one of their um, graduates, although he was only there for two years. He left school um, at the age of 15, I think, 14 or 15. Um, but he did, he did a lot of reading on his own. Uh, he read a lot of the, the sort of books that he would have ne he needed to read um, uh, to um, uh, to become a navigator. He, he, he knew what he wanted to do and he, he read the elements of navigation and those sort of books, as well as Robinson Crusoe. He read novels. He read all sorts of things. He was a big, he was a great reader. Did he write much about his family and life before the Navy? Any mention of his mother? Gee, um, I don't know. I, actually, that's that's very interesting. I don't know that he ever mentioned his mother, who died uh, shortly after his younger brother Samuel was born. So, his, and his father died again. His 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 father married again, um, and he corresponded with his stepmother. Um, I no, I've I've never seen him mention his mother. Who, who would have died when he was, um, oh goodness, um, eight or nine or something like that. So I, I've never seen him talk, I've never really read that he's talked about his childhood in that way. Ah, the statue. Thank you, Chris, for writing about the statue. Um, yes, um, there's a lot to say about the statue. It was, it was erected at uh, Euston Station um, in 2014, which is the, two, the bicentenary of Flinders' death. It was erected there because it was known that Flinders had been buried in St James's churchyard, which was uh, we knew was underneath one of the platforms there. And um, so I was privileged to be on the committee, which um, which uh, organised for that statue to happen, uh, which was, you know, three years, lots and lots of, of, of negotiations and work. And of course, the wonderful um, statue, the, the wonderful design and um, artistry of Mark Richards uh, to, to make that wonderful statue and express Flinders in such a um, 
such a vivid way at Flinders at work rather than Flinders the sort of heroic figure standing on the prow of a ship or whatever, which is the more usual uh, way we see him. Um, <clears throat> Um, of course, since that time, um, last year, they they did a, they did in fact find Flinders' uh, bones, his uh, coffin, under that platform uh, when they were building the HS2. So, uh, luck I was lucky to be in uh, in London, sort of this time last year, and uh, was able to meet some of the archaeologists on that on that. Um, on that job, which was, which was very, very interesting. Oh my goodness, Christina! I think we might have to talk about this off offline. Um, uh, you wanted my idea of the parallel self that appears at certain points. Um, the idea of the parallel self in life writing. I'm not an expert in life writing. This is really just something that I've I've noticed in um, in Flinders' writing, and um, I'm sure experts in life writers write life writing who might be be watching might have a lot more to say about that, but um, it seems to me that it probably is something that one does if if one sits down to write about one's life. You, you might often be go daydreaming and make up some some sort of self that that isn't the real one. So, um, Janita, ah, you mentioned that he regarded his family as having little ambition, particularly interested in his relationship with his brother Samuel. Um, do I think that this is why Sam Flinders was so frustrated with Samuel? Uh, can I speculate on their relationship? Um, Samuel and Matthew had a, a, a slightly, there was friction definitely in the relationship between Matthew and Samuel Flinders. Flin Samuel was the second lieutenant on the, on the investigative voyage. Um, Samuel, I think, um, probably was uh, wasn't too happy about being just one of the one of the people who was bossed around by his big brother, um, and uh, there were there was definitely a lot of tension later in London um, between them. There was the, there was all, almost a a, a falling out between them. Um, so um, yeah, that that they did make up, I think, later. Um, but it was a it was a there was a perhaps sibling rivalry, perhaps envy. I don't know. Um, Matthew had a very sort of fatherly attitude to Samuel, but. Um, but Sam, perhaps Samuel didn't really like that. He thought he was being patronised. I'm, I'm not sure. There's, there's a lot in that one. Um, direct link advice, professional guidance given by Cook to Matthew Flinders. Well, no, but only via um, William Bly, who was, of course, Bly learnt from Cook and uh, Flinders learnt from Bly. So that's, um, you know, Cook, Cook was, Cook died, you know, when Matthew was only, you know, three or four. But Cook, of course, Flinders read Cook's Cook's voyages, and Flinders would have known everything that Cook had written, um, or any, everything that he could he could get his hand or, hands on. So um, yeah, I, I, there was a sort of a, a, at one remove link. What happened to Flinders' coffin and bones? and uh, remains they found on the platform, uh, well, under the platform, that it is going to be um, reinterred in uh, Donington, in his birthplace. That was going to happen um, in July this year, probably on the sort of around about the date of his anniversary of his death, which is uh, 19th of July. But of course, that's had to be uh, postponed um, I'm sure they'll be there in. Uh, they say, but being looked after safely by the archaeologists in the meantime. But they, there will be uh, a ceremonies and um, and uh, there will be a lot of a lot of activity and and at Donington, the Church of Saint Mary and the Holy Rood in Donington.
uh, when the uh, when his uh, his remains are brought back home, um, and they are really looking forward to that time. Ah, do I have any plans to attend Matthew's funeral? Well, I I very much hope so. I was going to be there this year, but of course, um, it, well, of course, it will depend on circumstances. But I will very very much like to be there um, if I possibly can. Thank you. <laughs> Um, nice to hear from someone in Lincolnshire. Are there any more questions? Um, somebody did ask about, I think, where the um, uh, trim, the biograph, trim, the cartographer's cat. Um, I it should be available on Amazon and all the usual places. It's published by Bloomsbury in the UK, so uh, I think you should find it fairly easily. Um, the other publication which you might find interesting is the private journal, Matthew Flinders private journal, which is um, uh, was published by the Friends of the State Library of South Australia and, and you can get that um, from their web page. Um, so I think that's all we have time for now. So thank you very much all for listening. It's been a great pleasure interacting with you and um, talking to people from all over the world. Um, good night.